Okay, so um, we are going to together actually architect a dynamic internal developer platform. Um, and so first of all, I want to quickly speak about the making of, of this re reference architectures, what problems we aim to solve, the design principles that we applied, and we are going to go to the actual design. And then I'm going to like a dry run walkthrough if you want. And um, I've asked um, in the for platform con for our last conference, we're, we're expecting up to 20,000 people this year. I've really asked um, all the speakers, hey, please focus on reference architecture. So I hope there are a lot more reference architectures coming. We had 500, uh, 500 proposals for talks. I think we accepted 100. So super excited about that. Make sure you have a look at this as well. So um, again, um, I talked about that. McKinsey is working on this, um, starting with Amazon, and then we have a lot of others coming. But there are a lot of different enterprises and actual platforms that we looked at. Um, for that, and we've uh, used common patterns. And um, I think it's worth noticing that we have an like a like a size bias, right? So those architectures are designed for teams with up to with, with not up to you know thousands of users, but from you know minimum fifty users, rather one hundred users onwards. Uh, so if you're like a cool startup and you're just starting off and you're fresh and standardization doesn't matter, please use Vercel or Heroku. Um, but other than that, this is actually, uh, I think, something pretty cool. Okay, um, let's go ahead. What are the problems that we wanted to um, solve? Um, the usual things that why we're doing platform engineering. We have long lead times. It just takes too long. Time to market. We're in a recession. It needs to go faster. Uh, other, uh, otherwise, executives are sad, and then we have too much ticket ops, and we have high cost of maintenance, and we have overwhelmed developers, and we have waiting times, and we have uh, missing self-service, and that's because our setup is unstructured. It's because we have too many versions of Postgres, and we need to maintain them, and we have too many files here, and too many Terraform files, and the communication doesn't work, all of these things. And now, we want to get into a situation with low lead time. We want to have a high degree of standardization. I cannot say that enough. That's the, that's the key thing here. We need to design systems. We're going to get into the design principles that drive standardization by design. We want to have to a certain degree, and many people have crucified me for this, but we want to have a certain degree of separation of concern. Yes, ownership of the services. Yes, to a certain degree, you build it, you run it. But separation of concern is nothing to be afraid of. Abstractions are nothing to be afraid of as long as you don't take context. And then we want to have self-service. And um, that is another uh, principle here. Okay. Um, the, um, yeah, exactly. Um, and so um, the, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the sequencing, if you want, and it took me a while to understand this, you want to be able to dynamically generate configurations. We want to have, however you do this, but we want to have, and I'm going to explain what that means, a design that is able to dy dynamically generate application infrastructure configurations with every deployment because the drive standardization by design. By doing this, we enable all of these things, self-service, eliminate ticket ops, golden paths. And I'm going to be very concrete. It's another bit, little bit of buzzwords, but I'm going to be very concrete. And because of this, we are slashing lead time. So this is actually sort of the logical thing here. I want to make sure that we give the right people credit because I didn't code this. This has been done by uh, Stefan Schneider, Mike Gatto, and Marco Maruli. And I think we'll hear a lot more from them. Um, and um, I wanted to insert photos, but I didn't find good photos. Uh, so we'll probably do that uh, hopefully when we send this out. Um, what is a reference architecture? First of all, those are standard patterns on how to combine frequently used tools and design choices. We'll have them as visual flow diagrams, and you're going to see that now. We have that package as code. That's in open sourcing. We have white papers on this. We can share that. And then we are going to have, we don't have that yet, tutorials on how to actually interact with them. And we're going to do a lot of this. Cool. What are the design principles that we've applied? Number one, golden paths over cages. What does that mean? It means very concretely, follow this platform, use this, if you use this, you get certain guarantees. If you want to go off the golden path, please do so. Opaque abstractions. We don't force anybody. You can do whatever you want. You can go down to the lowest level, but then, my friend, you're on your own. Second, we want to have standardization by design. What does that concretely mean? By using the system to deploy and deliver your application, we are keeping the degree of standardization as is 
or we are improving it by deploying more, by adding more services, we are not making it more complex. And that's a very, very, very difficult thing to achieve, but th that's what we've tried to apply to here, apply here. Possible through dynamic over static configurations. That means rather than having, I don't know, Terraform Helm combinations that you need to maintain and they're really clean at day zero because you fork a um, something from a service catalog, but then they start derailing through the lifetime of the application through the environments, rather than that, we treat every day like day zero. If there's anything I want you to take away, treat every day like day zero, regenerate app and infrastructure configurations with every single deployment. And then we wanna have code, fir uh, code first. Very important, modern enterprise, um, we, we wanna have, we wanna make sure that we have disaster recovery. We wanna make sure everything is as code and we never break the workload of the developer. Where is the developer in code? And that doesn't mean you can't put a user interface on top. We're going to um, have that as well. And you can do all sorts of fancy things and CLIs and yada, yada, yada. Um, and I even advocate for leaving interface choice, but the code needs to be the single source of truth. Okay, cool. So that's it, right? This is the reference architecture. Um, and uh, this is a lot of lots of logos. Let me say one first thing. You can interchange all of the logos. Um, you know, you can you can use different CI pipelines. You can use five different CI providers. You can use three different registry providers. You can use different orchestrators, different resource plans. It doesn't matter. That logical design is all the same. Um, and we have five layers. And for me, this was also McKinsey's uh, pr proposal. So you know, I'm piggybacking on their fame. But um, they have they 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 dissected this into five different control plane layers. You have the developer control plane layer, which is the interaction between the developers and the platform engineers and everybody with the platform. You have the integration delivery plane. You have the resource plane. You have the monitoring plane, and you have the security plane. And what I want to do right now is I want to go through the different planes, explain what they are, explain the design choice, and then. What we're going to do as a um, as in the next step, we are actually going to follow a simple deployment because the unit of change in this platform is the deployment. Um, so all of these activities always happen at deployment time. That's our pulse of business, if you want. Um, and uh, that's exactly what we're going to do here. Let's sort of a couple of observations. We've we've in this uh, reference architecture cho chose um, backstage as a portal because it's the most commonly used. Um, there's another one coming with um, GCP uh, and that's using Atlassian Compass, which I think is sort of the second big player in that uh, portal space. Not many know it yet, but um, it's we're seeing it in more and more uh, cases and it's accelerating really, really fast. And I'm, if you're in the, in the Atlassian ecosystem, I'm personally a big fan. Then we have obviously version control. We're using SCORE as a workload specification. In this case, infrastructure as code with Terraform, but you could swap that logo with Crossplane or uh, Pulumi or whatever. Uh, we have um, uh, GitHub Actions here, uh, Amazon ECR, Humane uh, Takers and Platform Orchestrator. This is, I think, a little misleading. Um, the actual implementation, we're using Argo CD, which is the most the, the commonly used and has much more beef. Uh, and then you have uh, the resource plane layer here. And this, I think I, I've seen a version with, with Datadog, uh, very helpful. And this is um, HashiCorp Cloud uh, Vault, again, the, 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 the usual suspects. Cool. Now, let's actually um, get uh, cracking and dissect this. So developer control plane level. Um, and I we looked at this already a little bit. Um, obviously, uh, let's zoom in. Um, and the first thing that I want to zoom into, the thing that, not everybody's using yet um, is, um, yeah, this is a little here, let's start with this first, the workload uh, specification. And the workload specification, what is that actually? It's a um, general recipe on how my workload relates to dependent resources. If you want, it's a general way of explaining my architecture to a system. And I'm explaining this in an environment agnostic way, which means that the description is it doesn't matter whether it's staging or production. In any case, my, in this example, Python service depends on a resource of database, Postgres, storage S3, and um, then a type DNS. And then we have a connection string that tells my workload how to connect to my database. And I, I this is actually how the score file looks. So it's not, um, I'm depending on that particular RDS database. No, we're saying 
I'm depending on a database of type Postgres. Now, there is exactly one score file, one workload specification, and you can use score, you can use anything else. That sort of doesn't matter. We're using score because, you know, it's the open source project I worked on, so I'm in love with it. But, you know, what? you can write your own. Many enterprises have their own version of this. Um, and uh, you have one of those workload specifications, and they sit next to your workload source code, um, and um, you then localize them on an environment-by-environment environment basis. So that's the workload specification. This is where... If you want the developer with every single deployment orders what they need, okay? Um, and then the other interfaces are used in different situations. So, um, and I listed this and we're going to send it over, but um, let's actually have a look at, and this is not data-driven. You know, I've, I've jotted my, my observations down. You know, I would have loved to give you, this is against 1000 uh, um, people, but that's really just what I'm observing. So. Usually for deployment, you have your Git push flow, right? Terminal IDE. Then for configurations and change to configurations, you have the workload specification. Same thing if you want to add and remove a resource. And that's already like a hint. Now you can actually add a resource by just saying, hey, I'm adding another resource definition to the workload specification. You can do that on the go. And by just doing a Git push, it will create that resource and wire this up promote this to the next environment, and it will do that in the next environment. So that's the beauty here. So this is what we're using for uh, removing resources. Then for rollbacks and diffs, because we have that single source of truth, we would probably use an API CLI UI resource detail configuration. So how is the config of the S3 bucket actually looking? Definitely infrastructure as code, predominant method still Terraform, spinning up a new environment. By definition, if every day is day zero, you can also do that. Um, that's definitely API, CLI, or UI. Same for logs, although that would probably be aggregated as the portal layer. I don't think that this is so correct. Then the portal, the service catalog, you would use that if you want to you know, search what microservices we already have. We have an inner source use case. Has this been done before? Definitely portal. And we have a service create, like a scaffolding case, right? So there's usually the portal in combination with the uh, templating um, API of something like GitHub or Git, GitLab. So those are the interfaces. And so the answer, it, it depends what the user is using. And the answer is, hey, different users, different um, choices. If you have a couple of dozen developers, some developers like the CLI, some developers like to use the code base. And I'm a big fan. If you really want to drive adoption, the system should be designed in a way that they can actually choose this. Cool. So this is our um, developer control plane layer. The next element is the integration and delivery plane. And a number of these things are obviously familiar. We have our CI pipeline building uh, the code, and then we need to push the code somewhere. Um, and in that case, it's a registry, and I'm using ECR here, it could be any other. And then we have the orchestrator component, and the orchestrator is basically a configuration file generator, like a smart config file generator with sophisticated RBAC functionality, could deploy, could orchestrate infrastructure, but could also just call other APIs, like call Terraform Enterprise, call, um, I don't know, hand over to Argo CD, whatever. But the job of the orchestrator is to read that score file and say, hey, okay, well, where are you deploying to? Environment of type staging. Well, perfect. Let me dig up what database to wire you or what to create for you. Create the app configs, um, pull the secrets, and then actually um, hand over to deploy, to deploy itself. So that's the integration and delivery plane. Let's go to the next element, the resource control plane, also comparably um, straightforward. What we, uh, um, what we have here, those are the infrastructure components you're using um, today. Uh, in this example, uh, so out of the box, this platform is code, just to give you a couple of examples, is um, spinning up an EKS cluster, and then you, know, you can order namespaces or whatever you have. Um, RDS as a database, Route 53, Amazon S SQS, but the design of this architecture allows you to really genuinely use whatever you want. You can use, um, you know, you can have your Postgres running on a VM in a basement of your grandmother that you've never looked at in um, ages, and you can wire this up. Anything that can, you know, construct a, uh, you, you know, has has an API basically is something you can you can wire here. So that's the resource and um, control plane. And um, because we are ap applying dynamic configuration management, it's totally possible to have many cloud estates. So another thing that's coming out is um, this in a multi-cloud example. Um, multi-cloud or 
multi-cluster in this case doesn't really, you know, is, is that much of a difference then. Um, because the actual configurations are created with every deployment, the configurations are created uh, against the target environment. So that means if you are deploying to um, Amazon or you're deploying to Google, you know, it, it doesn't matter that much because that's going to be localized. And um, what this also supports is fairly complicated um, resource combination orchestration, if you want. So uh, let's say, give you an example, the developer in the score file says, hey, I need DNS. Well, what that actually means in the real world is, yeah, you need DNS. You probably also need a certificate issued, right? And you know, you need in ingress. And that means that simple request DNS, if we would just translate that, that wouldn't be enough. So we uh, that, that would actually create an acyclic resource graph and sequence the creation of these elements. So they're actually uh, ready in combination, um, which also allows you to then QA this better and um, operate against this uh, more, more sustainably in its scale. So that's the resource control plane here. Um, then we have the monitoring and logging plane. And here, this is too simple. So actually, if you know, if, I've, if I have a couple of areas where I think we need to improve this, um, that's definitely the monitoring and logging plane. Because the reality is you have APM, right? You want to see what's going on in my infrastructure. You have a whole topic around error messaging. So how do you surface errors from different infra infrastructure components centrally? You have a whole conversation around um, how do you central, like stream centralize the elements of uh, the or the outputs of the workflow. How is CD performing? Um, are there any sign offs that need to happen? Um, all of these things need to actually be uh, aggregated. And that's a pretty non trivial task. So, actually, here you need more. And then you probably want to aggregate that on an uh, orchestrator API level or on a portal level. So, that's actually easier to consume um, for, the, for, the, for, for, for the user. So, that's the monitoring and Logging plane, but you know, pretty much you want to have the observability tied in. You probably, if you're crea creating the app configs with every single deployment, you know, you can enforce the use of sidecars, uh, labels, and annotations. Make sure that you really have good coverage here, uh, and make sure you can actually centrally pull in all the logs on a workload by workload basis, and really see uh, what's what's going on. So that's here the monitoring and logging plane, and then there's the next element where I think you know, real life is a lot more complex. The security plane, you know, now secrets management with, with Vault, but then, you know, we often have policy systems, compliance-based translator elements that say, well, in this situation, you need to create a ticket and it needs to be approved and it goes into production. So I think all of those things also need to find their way in. So this is heavily uh, simplified, but a good Good starting point, I think. Yeah, so now those are all of these um, different uh, elements. And now what I actually want to uh, do, let's quickly go back to our beautiful overview graphic here. I want to actually follow a deployment, our unit, our rhythm of business, all the way from the Git push down to the running um, application to the configured resources. Um, and before we do that, I want you to understand that again, that idea of dynamic configuration management. And nine out of 10 people, when they say, yeah, I get dynamic configuration management now, don't really get it because it's very different to the approach that we've been uh, uh, you know, uh, approaching for a, for a good uh, decade or so. So let's go uh, through this again. I think about dynamic configuration management as an asynchronous love affair between platform engineering and application developers which is um, such an unsatisfying um, experience, right? Having an asynchronous love affair, <laughs> but um, uh, that's really what it is. So you, um, you have that abstract description of the world. Hey, I'm a developer, I have a, a workload. It depends on a database of type Postgres. I'm describing what I need. Now I'm sending that through my CI pipeline. And by doing that, by definition, I'm indicating a context, you know, otherwise that, that couldn't build. So it's a tag 
Uh, and then I have a matching criterion. I'm deploying to an environment of type staging. I'm deploying to an environment of type production. Uh, this is an ephemeral environment. I have an app ID. I have a test ID. I, I, I have an env ID. I mean, you, get, you get the drill. So there's some sort of indication of context. How we're doing the indication, you know, subject to the specific respective organization and, and whatever, but we have a context. Now, I'm sending the context, it's making its way through CI, and I would do that if I've applied a change to a workload um, source code. And um, with every deployment, I, I've used that sentence a lot, but it's also very important. With every deployment, the score file is making its way through my CI pipeline and it hits the orchestrator. And now the orchestrator is performing an RMCD execution pattern. And it's called RMCD because of the song YMCA. That's actually the only reason because YMCA, you'll always remember this. And then you think about RMCD and it's easy to remember and you have the tunes in your, your ears. And RMCD means read, match, create, deploy. I'm reading the file and the orchestrator says, oh, there is a file. And because we treat every day like day zero, the orchestrator has no prejudice. So the orchestrator thinks, let me read that file and figure out what that workload needs. And reads the file, figures out, oh, needs a Postgres, needs a DNS, needs an S3. Okay, fine. Now, next step, read, match, match. What's the context? And the orchestrator again looks at the metadata and says, oh, yeah, this is an environment to a, this is a deployment to an environment of type staging. Well, let me look, make a look up what the platform engineering team wants me to use in that circumstance. Now, let's say in that case, we say, oh, this is just a deployment to development. I just want you to use the, the there is already like a Postgres database and I don't want you to create a new one. I just want you to route to the existing one. Okay, says the orchestrator. I'm going to go over to the next stage, the create stage. In the create stage, we're going to say, okay, we'll create application and infra application configurations by applying that workload to baseline configs. You know, think of them like empty Helm charts. And then we are actually going to create or wire existing infrastructure components. In the very trivial case, we'll just reach out to the Amazon API and fetch the latest credentials and then inject them through secrets at runtime into the container. Um, or in the more complex case, we're going to do advanced um, resource, uh, cyclic resource graphs, and we'll do all sorts of procedures in the background, and then we'll we'll route everything up. Now, um, then there's the deployment stage. At the deployment stage, we again have, you know, you guessed it, code files. And those code files can sit in a repository, and then something like Argo can take over, um, or um, we'll handing over to other orchestration things, or your orchestrator can do that in-house if you want, you know, that depends on the um, on the on the systems you're using. But in the end, that's what we have. Every single deployment, we have dynamically regenerating configurations and we have that hot, juicy, asynchronous love affair between platform engineering and application developers. Good. Uh, and what we're going to do now is, and that's like a world premiere, we are actually going to look at a golden path. So um, a golden path is something that the developers can use. And if they stay on this, they get certain guarantees. And I wanna show you the first golden path now. And it's a golden path that's so trivial, trivial you'll think, what the fuck, Casper? my GitHub Actions can do that today. What are you talking about? It's deployment to development. N nothing is special about deploying to development, really like nothing. But by taking the most trivial case, You'll get, you, you'll, you'll get an understanding on how this actually works and pans out, and you will understand, even in that trivial case, what is the beauty of standardization by design? Okay, so we're deploying to development. We've applied a change to our little Python service. Nothing special. Git push. Let's, let's let it run. Our workload specification also runs, because it's always uh, being sent, and um, we now have the context. The context environment equals development, environment type actually equals development. And then we are going to hit at some point the orchestrator component and the orchestrator is thinking it's tune, read, match, create, deploy, RMCD. It's reading this, it's matching the context, it's creating the configs, it's configuring the resources. In this case, it's really just reaching out because the resources are already there and then it's deploying and we have our clusters configured and everything is wired and um, everybody's happy. 
Now, again, you're looking at this and saying, okay, well, great, you know, whatever, you have a deployment uh, to development, congratulations. Well, the thing is, while this is the case, there are like a ton of things that could have changed under the hood. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, you might have changed the labels and annotations that you want in workloads, right? You might want a different sidecar. You might want to update Postgres version 14 from to Postgres version 15. You have different, I can give you like hundreds of examples. Now in the normal world, you would send out a request to all developers. Can you please update that? And then after a week you would do this again and nobody does it. And then um, after four weeks, you ask your CTO to send the email. It's like, we've all done that a couple of times. Now in this world, all you change is the baseline configuration. And then with the next deployment, these things are dynamically flowing in. Standardization by design, by just using the system, it is standardizing itself. So that's the beauty. And now because we are dynamically creating stuff, we can actually take this to the next level and we can go into the scaffolding workflows and we can go into the creation of a new environment, for instance. And let's actually do this. And this is my uh, golden path scenario number two. We want to create a new environment. And what's the developer experience? Incredibly simple. We take the exact same score file. We take the exact same code. And the only thing we change is that we indicate a new context. And the context in this case is, hey, this is an environment of type ephemeral. It hits the orchestrator. The orchestrator says, R, M, C, D, exactly. Read, match, hey, environment equals ephemeral. All right. Well. Now I'm going to create a Postgres. I'm going to create an S3 bucket. I'm going to create a DNS. Wait a minute, DNS, we need ingress and certificate. Oh, cool, I can do that as well. I'll use Terraform or Crossplane, or I will automatically send an SMS to the Vatican and the Pope will do it himself and then send back the credential. It doesn't really matter. We do that. And then we create the application configurations. We receive the credentials, secrets. We wire everything up, yeah, blah, blah, and then it's deployed and we have a new namespace. We have RDS, S3, DNS, everything is in the latest state. Okay, that's the second golden path. And this also means, well, it doesn't matter whether this is the first time or the 10th time, this could be a scaffolding. This could be after two years that this application exists and this is running through completely automated and making sure everything is uh, tidy and clean. Cool. Next example here is um, just for the sake of it, deployment to production. What's the message I want to send? The message I want to send is it's the exact same thing, uh, you know, uh, indicate context and then um, we have everything running. Mm. The more important example is what happens if you want to go off the golden path? You know, I'm, I'm always another nice buzzword that I'm always saying is uh, golden paths, not cages, you know? And um, so how do you ensure that this isn't a golden, golden, golden cage, right? Because I mean, these, these things are great, but there's always that situation where you need a resource and the platform engineering team hasn't provided it yet. And that's a very, very frustrating experience for the user because now you have the feeling, oh, you know, I've been restricted and I have to wait for another team. And how is this best, better than what I have today? And the wonderful thing here is you can give an answer to that. And the answer is going off the golden path. I will use the example of ArangoDB, which I'm always using because ArangoDB is something you never need until you need it. And so then you say, well, I need ArangoDB, but, and you're sending the request to the orchestrator and maybe that has dry run functionality and it's returning, hey, ArangoDB, I don't know that. I have no idea what to do. So, you know, in, in most cases you would be stuck now, not in this case, you can actually teach the system how to create a RangoDB, right? And that is also what I mean by layered abstractions. If assuming the developer has the role-based access control to do so, they can now go, now go in and actually define how a RangoDB is set up. That, that, that resource knowledge graph, if you, if you want, can actually learn decentrally. And this is, leading to something that is a, was a revelation for me two weeks ago, that if you want platform engineering, good platform engineering is actually about cutting and designing your repositories 
in a sustainable way. I, it was mind blowing for me when I when I when I uh, uh, first first heard that. But then actually, there's a lot of truth to this. We are going to look at this in a second. And so that's exactly what you can do here. Hey, you're just teaching that system. Well, by the way, this is how you create a RangoDB. And in those situations, if those matching criteria are met, should you actually be using a RangoDB? All right. So again, hits the orchestrator R and CD, and then we have a RangoDB. But the next time a developer now needs a RangoDB and the matching criteria are hit, fuck, a RangoDB is there, right? And so that's actually what I want to double down a little, a little bit more. That platform engineering is about structuring repositories. Um, a, a good setup, right, has a certain has a different repository structure than a lot of the repository structures that we're that we've been used to. So, and if I'm if I'm saying developer owned or platform engineering owned, I'm not saying that this is mandatory, and I'm not saying that sometimes there are developers that have both roles. That really really depends on the compliance and security posture of your respective organization, right? So I'm just uh, I was just in London yesterday with a you know, large bank. And at that large bank, the the division would be very, very extreme. You know, you the, the, it's not in the realm of possibilities that a developer is allowed to change the respective configurations of an S3 bucket in production. But, you know, this is not going to happen. But let's say you are in a, in a less security uh, heavy environment, then you could absolutely say, hey, as a developer, you can maybe change everything globally until you get into pre-prod and you can actually send a pull request to the global uh, configuration of an S3 bucket. But what's different, and let's have, actually have a look at this, is that we do separate these things out. So the developer actually now primarily owns the workload. Um, you have the work in, your, in, in, in every workload repository, you have the workload source code, you have a workload specification file, you, know, you have your Docker file, you have your pipeline YAML. And then you have the things that are cross-cutting uh, across the organization. And the first thing that I want to look at with you, again, is the workload profile here um, in the middle. And you can think of the workload profile, I said that before, like an empty Helm chart, and it contains the things we need to create the application configurations. That could be CPU minimum allocation, labels and annotations, uh, maybe the fact that HashiCorp Vault should start up as a sidecar, all of these things. Now, um, Workload profiles are uh, have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a workload, but no, it's not one-on-one. -on -one, it's one to many. So one workload can actually um, workload profile can be used in many many different uh, um, workloads um, because in reality, and I can tell you that firsthand, even if you're a very 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 large organization, you maybe need three, four, five different workload profiles. That is pretty much it. Um, now then we have the, the way that resources are created. And that again, or wired. And that again differentiates static. So resources that you don't want to have lifecycle owned by the platform, they are just referenced. So you can register them and say, hey, by the way, we have this Postgres, it's already there. If somebody hits those criteria, please route. And then you have dynamic resources. And those are resources that if somebody needs an S3 and it needs to be spun up, please use this template. So this would be usually infrastructure as code. The difference is you now don't have, I was at this absurd case today where they had 470 different ways of creating Postgres across all teams. And you can say, you know, why not? But you can also say, like, why would that be a good idea? It's there, there are no, it, it doesn't make sense. There are not, you don't need 470 different ways to, to instantiate Postgres. This is not necessary. Like you maybe need a couple. And so that's what you would actually have here. And then uh, you have resource definitions and resource definitions, you know, there's a Terraform provider for an orchestrator, for instance, that says if the end ID is staging and the uh, app ID is ABC, then please use the following resource drivers. And the last thing are certain automations, compliance elements, and, and all of these things. And that's it. And so if, if you want to have that case, a RangoDB, well, what you actually do is that you go into the Terraform provider for the orchestrator. And by the way, we can do that together. It's a fun exercise. 
Um, so this is the provider. You go into the Terraform provider, you go into the documentation, uh, boom, and we read this documentation from, from, from the bottom. Um, yeah, this is actually a terrible example. Let's look at this. So you say, well, uh, this one here. Okay, so you say, if the criteria app ID equals test app, and the user wants a Postgres, then I want you to use the following resource definition. Period, that's it, right? Or let's take another example. If amp type is staging and app ID is test app and amp type is development and app ID is test app, then please um, at the request of GKE use this resource definition. That's it, it's not super complicated. So that means in that case, right? Where we want to um, uh, train the system how to create a RangoDB, what that train the system actually means is you are extending that central um, logic on when to use what. Cool. Um, all right. So now, you know, I, I bombarded you with stuff. I'm, I'm sure you're completely overwhelmed. If you want to be even more overwhelmed, then you can read the white paper on this. That um, That is, there's one coming out on um, uh, mckinsey.com and um, I wrote another one that, uh, you know, that adds more of these, these things in. It's a little more, you know, detailed, 36 pages. So if you're at home with your partner and you really want to have a great thing to read at night, 36 pages of juicy platform content, uh, definitely cool. And the package version is ready. It's coming hopefully soon. There is no tutorials. So it's extremely hard for, to use for you. But um, uh, I'm hoping um, some of these guys can write tutorials uh, and otherwise, um, otherwise, I hope somebody else does it or I'll do it. And then you can actually try these things yourself uh, and um, you know, wire everything up and package this. Cool. Uh, and then you know, last comment, there are like a ton, ton more coming. Uh, the GCP one is in development right now. And then I think next is Azure and then either multi-cloud and then OpenShift. So yeah, pretty cool. All right. Uh, cool. Thank you so much, Kasper, and hope everyone uh, have a great end of the day or beginning of the day. <laughs> Bye. Bye.